instead of praying. Heavenly Father, thank you, Almighty God, for loving us and caring for us like only you can. And Father, you are supernaturally in control, oh God. You are supernaturally our God, our Lord, our King. Besides you, there is no other. So Father, I pray in your rich love and your mercy that you would speak through me, that I might speak to your people, oh God, that we might hear from you today, and that we might be forever changed, having been in your presence, oh God. So have your way. Do what you only you can do, O oh God. Uh, change us from the inside out. Make us more like you. And Father, we thank you for what you're going to do. And we love you, we worship you, we adore you. It's in Jesus' precious and holy and wonderful name.
uh, and I never fully comprehended all that. And then, um, as time went on, I God allowed me to, uh, as I was a part of churches, God had uh, allowed me to become uh, an, an elder um, in some churches that I was a part of as a young person and, uh, and a leader there. And then, fast forward back to 13 years ago, God allowed me to become an elder and a pastor um, at Commitment Community Church um, as an associate pastor there. So God was fulfilling his purpose and his plan, his calling upon my life. That wasn't something that I had chosen for myself, but that was something that God had birthed in me, that God had purposed in me, that God had done in me um, to fulfill his work and his calling. Fast forward now, God has allowed me uh, the privilege of being a senior pastor here at Crescent Bible Church. That wasn't my, necessarily my choosing, but that was God's calling. That was God's choosing His work and His thing and His purpose and His plan upon my life for me. Now, um, it was Him. It was all about Him and God doing it. Him doing the work in my heart, and it was about Him calling and choosing me for His work and what He wanted to do. And it was Him that equipped me with gifts and uh, abilities and, and, uh, that equip me to be able to even do this, even right now. Now think about ourselves. Um, how about us? Do we sense some type of calling in our lives? A call to a deeper relationship with Christ? A call to some type of service for Him? Does His calling? He does the calling and He does the choosing. Do we sense? Think about our own lives as we came to know Christ and we came to understand who He is. Do we sense a deeper calling in our lives? Is there something more that God wants us to do as a part of being a Christian now that we are born again, now that we are following Him, now that we are serving Him? Is there a deeper calling that He has in our own lives? Think about it. You know how God speaks to you. You know how God under, uh, looks at you and looks in your heart. Has God been doing that? And if so, what is it that, that He's been saying to you and how is it that you can put that into play? Well, today we're going to look at, as we look at this passage here, we're going to look at that and how that all comes to play um, in, the, in the work of choosing uh, another apostle in place of Judas. So we're going to look at that and see how that applies to us in our own lives here and now for today. Let's go on. It says here, it says, um, we're going to look at three specific uh, points. Um, first, we're going to look at Acts um, uh, chapter, we're going to look at three points, and this is Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 22. Disciples have a need that needs to be filled, and only God can fill it. Uh, two, um, is that all who were gathered together were there were of one mind and devoted themselves to prayer. And then three, is that disciples allowed God to do the choosing. God has already chosen whom he wants. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. Let's look at our first point, Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 22. Disciples have a need to be filled, and only God can fill that need. The apostles, um, in, verse, in verse 13, and let's look at verse 13. It says, when they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is, Peter and John and James and Andrew Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. Okay, so we see here that um, these were the 11 apostles that had originally walked with Jesus. They were the ones that were there when Jesus... When, when he was, Jesus was baptized, after Jesus was baptized, they were, um, by John the Baptist, that um, they were there from that point. They're the ones whom Jesus called. And the, as a fisherman, they called, they called them out, follow me, follow me, follow me. And so part of that 
office of discipleship, I mean office of apostleship, were very, in a very limited sense, limited to these original 11, and, and um, originally. And that means these were, the apostle was one who had walked with Jesus, and had seen Jesus, and had been with him, and understood him, and walked with him that whole, that, those, those three years. And that had actually seen Jesus and had heard Jesus' words. So that's, in the strictest sense, that's what apostle means. So now they were down to 11 apostles. Because uh, it goes on here and it talks about how uh, Judas, according to the scripture here, it says, let us home. It, 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 it says, for it is written in the book of Psalms, verse 20, let his homestead be made desolate and let no one dwell in it. God knew originally when Jesus came that Jesus was going to have 12 apostles. And God knew that Judas was going to betray his son. And he knew that from the, before the beginning of time, because God's plan and purpose, it just doesn't happen upon God. And God says, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. God knew all that. God planned, God had allowed all of this to happen. So as a result, it, it, it talks about in Scripture how um, God foretold that because he did this, it says, it says let his homestead be made desolate and let no one dwell in it. In other words, because he knew, he foretold in Psalms that the one who would betray his son, the, the promised one, the Messiah, let his homestead be made desolate. So Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And with that 30 pieces of silver, he went and he bought a field. And in that field, he ended up hanging himself. And of course, as the scripture says here, as the scripture says here, all of his intestines and his bowels came out. And so that story, it says here that the story circulated throughout all of, of all of uh, the whole region about Judas. And so let and so let and then it says let no one, and according to the scripture, it says let no one occupy that field. No one. There was nothing that was ever done with that field, the one that Judas was uh, committed suicide on. There was nothing that was ever done with that, because it was a field it was blood money. In other words, it was money that was used to betray Jesus. This was according to God's plan, God's purpose, that no one would ever do that. So the apostles were down to eleven. So they had the need there. There were the need was that they needed another apostle to make the 12 apostles, the original, to have another one fill the spot of Judas. And so as a result here, it says at the end of part of verse 20, it says a scripture and it says, and let another man take his office. Again, so God had the plan. God had it worked out. God had, God's a God of order, so he had something set up, something that was in place. And he was going to use his apostles, use his, his the leadership there, use the, the men that God put over them, over the people, to uh, fulfill and to take care of that uh, issue of uh, another apostle. And so what did they do there? And so they go on here, therefore it is necessary, verse 21, that of the men who have accompanied us at the same time that the Lord Jesus went up in and out among us, in the beginning, and it goes on um, and talks about until the day um, was taken from us, that one of these must come a witness with us of his resurrection. In other words, the apostles were, because they had been with Jesus, they, there must be another one that's going to, the purpose was so they could be a witness of his resurrection. In other words, they walk with him, but they also 
where they saw him, they were aware of him, that, and they saw him after his resurrection, and they saw him while he came in among them. And so they're going to be a witness. The purpose of the apostle was, so not only because they saw Jesus, but also that they were going to be a witness of who Jesus is. So that's the reason. That was the need. They needed someone else to be that witness. And what was the work of the apostle was, it was to establish the apostles, was to establish the church. Remember, the church had not yet been established yet. Jesus had ascended into heaven and he commanded them. And so, uh, to, to, to do his work and to go and tell others about him and be witnesses for him. And so, that's going to happen in the form of the church. But the, the apostles were the ones who were going to go out as the initial witnesses, and they were the ones who were going to go out and set up those local churches. They were the ones who were going to go out and set up the structure there. They were the ones who were going to go out and set up the, the body the way God had set it to be. And so the ones, the apostles were the ones who were going to do that. And that's why they needed that 12th apostle. And that's why they needed that person who was going to go in there and do the work that God had commanded them to do. Since that was a need, they were short one person, and they needed the twelfth person to fill that, uh, to fill that spot, to go out and be that witness, to prepare the church, to prepare the church, uh, the church, the churches that God would set up throughout all the world. Because without them, that's how the church started, was through these twelve. These original twelve, that's how the work was started. And then they would witness to others, and then those others would witness to others, and those others would witness to others, and so it was a multiplication process. And so the church now is, is millions upon millions, uh, 2,000 years later, uh, a, a great and mighty church in this world. Um, so uh, that's, why, that's, why the import, that's the importance of it. Um, and it's so critical because the purpose was going to be carried out through them, and because one man disobeyed God and betrayed Jesus, now that, that purpose had to, uh, that, that room had to be fulfilled. Um, let's look at here, let's, uh, our, our next point is that all were gathered together, they were of one mind and devoted themselves to prayer. Uh, we look at verse 14. It says, these were all one mind who continually devoting themselves to prayer. Um, so they were all unified, had one heart. That's so, that's so important and so critical. We were talking about this in Sunday school. There's unity. There's oneness of mind. They were all together. There was about 120 of them. There was the apostles and the 11 apostles, and there was about 120 others. There was including women um, that were there, Mary's. Uh, Jesus' mom was there, and Mary Magdalene, and others, and Jesus' brothers were there. And so it says there that they were all of one mind. In other words, they had the same purpose in mind, they had the same heart in mind, they had the same thought, was, okay, God, what are you saying here? What is your mind? What is your heart? What are you desiring? They, that's what they wanted. They, it wasn't about an individual it wasn't about an individual plan or an individual agenda. It wasn't about an individual desire to see something happen. But it was about um, them being together as one for the purpose of choosing another apostle to take the place of Judas. That was their sole purpose. There was unity there. There was oneness there. Um, there was solidarity there. And that's why they were... And that's why... And that's what is so critically important in this process. That's how, and this is, remember, this is the beginning of the church. This is the beginning of what God wants to do with the church. And it's so, and it's so critical that they set the example from the beginning. That in order for the church, them to talk about the church and spread the church and to begin the church, they needed to have, they needed to be unified. Because you can't start something and be dis unified and disjointed and all over the place. And everyone having their own plans and their own purpose because it says, united we stand, divided we fall. And the reality was, is that God knew that. And so, and, and they understood that, the 120. 
the apostles and the 120 up in the room. They understood that. That in order for the church to go, to go out and the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to go out, in order for the church to grow and to be the church that he wants it to be, it needs to have one heart. And this is the perfect place to start that. They also understood something also very critically important as well. They devoted themselves to prayer. Prayer was, um, not only were they unified, but they understood that any wisdom that they need, any power that they needed, anything that they needed in order to accomplish the work that God had called them to do, to know God's mind, to know God's heart, to accomplish His work, it, needed, it only came through the power and the work of prayer because they knew that they couldn't do it out by themselves. They knew that they were incapable of doing anything in and of themselves, and they knew that the only way that they were capable of doing something was because they prayed and God equipped them to do the work that God called them to do. And without the prayer, and without them praying and seeking and being dependent upon God, they were going to be uh, they were going to have no power, and their work was going to be ineffective, and it was going to bear no fruit at all for the kingdom of God. And we wouldn't even be here today had not his people took the time and understood the principle that we need to pray in order for God's the, the work, in order for us to know God's heart, to know His work, and to do what He calls to do. And they did it together, and and. And, and prayer is just, and, and they understood that prayer was just critically, critically, critically important in the work of God. And this is in the beginning. And this, again, is another foundational work that they had done, that they re recognized and understood that there was unity, and now there's prayer. And without it, we can do nothing. Apart from me, as uh, Jesus said, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so what prayer is, they knew that prayer was a dependence upon God, upon Him, to do the work that He called them to do. So, and they were all there praying together, God, what is your mind? What's your heart for the next apostle? What are you saying? Who are you saying? Who is this you're saying? What do you want here, God? We need to know your mind. We need to know your heart. We need to know your understanding. We need to know what you want. doesn't matter what we want. doesn't matter who we're, who, who we're partial to or we're, we have, that we like or maybe we like a personality. We don't, it, God, it's not, it doesn't matter that, about that, God. We only want what you want. It's not what I want, God, but it's what you want. It's who you want, God, and to fulfill and to do the work that you call us to do because... Uh, what we want and what we desire doesn't matter. It's what you want and what you desire. And we need to know your mind and your heart to figure out who that is and to accomplish that work. And then let's go on here. And it says, um, disciples follow God, um, allow God to do the choosing. God had has already chosen whom he wants. That's verses 23 through 26. Disciples put forward our Sabbath, and Matthias. Now, these uh, these gentlemen were individuals again that had walked with Jesus with the other the other disciples and the other apostles and the other people. They had been with Jesus from the beginning. They weren't necessarily a part. They weren't necessarily a, a part of the original twelve apostles. But they were ones that were with Jesus. They were his disciples. They were his followers. They were ones that were right there. They witnessed Jesus. They had heard about, they heard Jesus' words. They heard about, um, and they saw, and they heard, and they witnessed him after his resurrection. They were there. So they understood. They understood. They understood the import. Uh, they understood what was being asked of them. In other words, they understood um, that we need to choose someone that has been with Jesus. So these men qualify for that. But more than importantly, and which is very critically important, is that um, uh, one must become a witness with us of his resurrection. In the part, second part of verse 22. 
So they needed to find someone that fit that quality. Not only did it be with Jesus, but they needed to have someone whom God was choosing for that position. Because it says that God knows what? The hearts of all men. God knows the hearts of every man. Um, it said, as it says, it said in, in 1 Samuel, when they were choosing David to be king, it says, and Samuel was going before Jesse, David's father, and, he, and, and David had eight brothers. He was he's the youngest of eight. And all of us, all his other big, big brothers, what, you know, usually when they, when they were choosing somebody for something, it was usually the oldest. And the oldest was, he was tall, and he was handsome, and, and, and God said to Samuel, that's not him. And then all of his other brothers passed, and he said, they're not him. And then God's, and then God came to, um, and, and, and Samuel asked Jesse, is there yet, is there not yet anyone else? It says there's one other one, but he's out in the field shepherding the sheep. And then God, and then, um, and then, and, and, and then Samuel told Jesse to go get him and bring him back. And God, and God told, and because Samuel realized that this is the one whom God has chosen, because it says in that passage, a scripture passage, when David came, it says, God says, God doesn't look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. David was the youngest, and that goes against tradition. You don't choose the youngest one. But that's not what God looks at. Because it says he was ruddy. Ruddy means he was handsome. And, but yet he was young. He was just a teenager, a youth at that time. And, but God saw what was in David's heart. And as you look at throughout history, and you look at the Psalms in the reign of King David, David always, David wasn't perfect, but he always came back to God in the end. Because David had a heart for God. And that's what God was looking at. So the quality was not one of the, the, um, one of the, the things that God was looking for is not this, that they were, had walked with Jesus, but what was his heart like? What was his attitude like? What was going on in that individual, in that person? And remember that Matthias and Barsabbath knew that there was going to be, a, um, there, 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 there was this need here of the apostle. And they, probably, and they knew in their hearts that they, they would probably be one of those two that would be chosen. But it was going to be God who did the ultimate choosing. And so for our Sabbath and Messiah, saying, oh, I know that would be great to be an apostle. Boy, I'd be proud to be excited. I'm going to be, wow, I'm going to be up there. I'll be part of the original 12. Wouldn't that be great? Wonderful. But one of them was thinking, God, this is an awesome Ask. God, this is an awesome responsibility. God, this is an awesome thing. And who, who am I to be able to fulfill that task? Who am I to be able to step in the shoes of, and be an apostle? And to be a witness as an apostle for his church to come. And as we find out... Um, God saw all that because, again, God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And it goes on here, and it says, it says, disciples prayed and seeking God's choice to fill the 12th spot. Verses 24 and 25. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen. Again, you know the hearts. So the qualifications and just a physical qualification a qualification was a heart qualification for any call. And so the disciples understood that in order to place, this is a big responsibility, to place someone in a position of authority, place someone in a position of leadership. Only God could see what was really 
in their hearts. Only God could really see what was going down deep down inside their hearts and the crevices. And that's the, and, the, and what God sees, and the apostles were of the mindset, and the leadership there at that time was of the mindset that, God, we only want what's in your heart. And so, God, if you see something in the heart of one of these two men that's not right, then don't let us have it. But if, if the one that you do see that has the right heart, you put him in place. And you make him the person that you want him. You put him in the place of that apostle. Because you look at the hearts, God. And that's what the leadership had in mind. They looked at not only just the physical qualification, but they looked at the heart qualification as well. Because that's a big difference. That's a big, big, big difference. Because you can't place someone in a position of service to God's people unless the heart is right before him. And so it goes on here and says, um, it says, they chose the method of casting lots to choose. Now, it was, they used stones, and however, however they did that, the, the lot fell to oh, Matthias. And so he took the place of Judas, and he filled that 12th spot. So ultimately, who was overseeing the lot that was cast? God was. Because God knew the heart of Matthias. And Matthias was the one whom God wanted at that point to fulfill that spot. And so he, he supernaturally, God supernaturally worked within the casting of a lot for the lot to fall to Matthias. Because that's whom the God wanted. Now, and that's the method that the disciples uh, the, and the apostles used in order to make that determination because they believed that God would work through that in order to help them to make that decision. Now it's funny that the, um, that in the, in, the, in the Bible they no longer use, they, that this was the last mention of them casting lots. I'm not sure why, but the reality is is that God used that in order to make that, help them to make that decision and that choice on who would be the right person and the right individual to take that spot and to take that lead. So that's, that's critically important. And see, and so God supernaturally saw, saw the, the whole process. God used the disciples, and he I mean, used the apostles, and God, God supernaturally uh, saw the heart, God knew the heart was in the hearts of the individuals, those candidates that were going to be the apostles. But he allowed the individuals, he allowed the apostles to do the choosing. In other words, the, the practicality of it. But they, the apostles, had to know, they had to have God's heart. They had to have God's mind. They had to have God's understanding in doing and choosing the right individual and the right person. Uh, so critically important. Now, God knows, as we look at our own lives, it says, God knows there is a need. He knows who and how he's going to fulfill that need. We all have needs in our life. We have needs within the body of Christ. We have needs within this body. We have needs within this body here. We don't. We don't. We do. And, that, and we know that. We know that that needs, needs to be filled. But we also know that um, that need um, is only going to be fulfilled by the person whom God wants that need to be filled by. And that God is preparing the heart of an individual or individuals uh, in the plural sense to fulfill that need or those, that, those needs that need to be filled. Because God already knows he knows the need, but he also knows the heart. He knows the individuals with whom he wants to fulfill those needs. And he raises and he prepares the hearts of individuals. And he looks at the hearts of individuals. And he sees those whose hearts are right, hearts to do things. Not just to be a pastor, but to be a servant. To be a um, to operate, to be a worship person, to be a um, uh, to be a pastor, to be a leader, to be 
um, to be uh, a great hospitality person, to be anyone with any number of gifts. But in order to operate in those gifts, the heart of that individual needs to be right in order to fulfill that need. Not just because they have the physical capability of doing it, but their heart needs to be their heart needs to be in the right place with God. The heart needs to be where God says it should be. And that's where, as we go on here, is that um, the body um, the, and the people within the body need to know that. The, the leadership needs to know that. In order to build God's church and local church, is that God needs to know, uh, the individual, the leadership needs to know within the body uh, what God knows. And that who is the person or individuals that God wants to use fulfill that, that, that spot and that need. And then God says uh, the body that has the need must be unified and have one heart. So in order for that need to be fulfilled, you need to have, as, a, as they did here, the body needs to be unified. They need to have one heart. They need to have one mind. They can't be all over the place. They can't have individual agendas or personal opinions or personal preferences. But they need to have one heart and one mind, which means God's heart and God's mind. And they need to be a people of prayer. In other words, everything that they do, everything that they they they, they accomplish, needs to be done as a matter of prayer. In other words, seeking God's heart, seeking God's mind, seeking God's voice. Okay, God, what are you saying here? Who? What are you? What, what's going on here, God? What's going on here? And that's what needs to make up the body of Christ. And that's what the leadership needs to be a part of, as a part of the body. We need to be people that are unified. We need to be a people that are praying. Seeking God, seeking your heart, seeking your mind, whatever you want, whatever you desire, whatever you long for. That's what I want, that's what I want, that's what I want, God. That's what I want. I don't want my heart. It doesn't matter what I want. It got, God, it doesn't matter what I want. My opinion doesn't matter. It's your opinion, it's your voice, it's your heart that matters. And that's where we need to be have one mind, because if we're of one mind and one heart, that means it's God's mind, God's heart. And then number two is, is that if we're praying, we're going to know God's mind and God's heart. Because we've prayed together, and we've, we've sought the Lord together, and we're, and we're seeking Him, saying, God, whatever you want, whatever you desire, whatever you choose, whoever you choose, whomever you want, um, this is what we want. And that's what leadership should be about. That's what God's people, that's what God's body should be about. Um, the body must allow and trust the leadership to follow God's lead and choose and choose whom God so chooses. In other words, it needs to choose, you need to allow God to, to, to have his way. And, uh, let, God, let God speak through the leadership in order to, to appoint people and to, uh, and, to, and to guide people and to lead people into whom he wants. I knew I had a calling on my life, but it was only as a part as I trusted the leadership and commitment at the time that um, they, it was confirmed in their hearts that, my, that God had called me to be a pastor. And it was a confirmation. It was, wasn't anything that we spoke about beforehand, but it was a confirmation in my heart, but it was also a confirmation in Pastor Cedric's heart at that time as well. And the reality was, is that God, it was God's choosing it was God's work, and it was God's calling. And then, as well, as far as just even the gifts, as giftings, is that it was God's choosing for his gifts in my own life. And it was God's choosing for his gifts in your own life. But it was all a matter of everyone operating in their giftings together. As the leaders, and, and then trusting the leadership to be able to recognize, okay, I see a gift in you. 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 Not just to put a body in a, in a spot. Not to put a body and, and place a body there just because there's a need. No, because a person's call has a gifting and the ability to be able to fill that need and to be able to fill that spot and to be able to do what God's called them to do. And trust the leadership that they hear from God, that they understand from God, to be able to, to work and see a person that God's working in a person's heart, to be able to determine, okay, I see that gifting in you, I see that calling in you. Will you be able to serve within the body here? Because that's so important as well. Um, 
And we must trust God without reserve. Um, because you're not... When the leadership hears from God and they understand what God's saying, what God's doing, is that it's not God, not that they're God. I'm not saying that the leadership's not God. But what I'm saying is that when the leadership is following God's heart and, and following God's lead, and they're unified and they're praying, and the body's unified and the body's praying, they're all going to be of one heart. They need to trust that the leadership hears from God. Because it's not the leadership's opinion that matters. But it's God's heart that matters. So if the leaders are people of God and the, and, and, and the body are really following God, they're going to understand that the leaders are people that are here in God's heart. It's not their matter of their personal preference or personal opinion or personal plan, but it's God's personal preference, it's God's personal plan, it's God's preference to do His work, to do what He wants them to do. So the reality is you need to trust that. So if God says, I want you to do something, and the leadership comes and says, um, this is what I believe God's gifting and calling on your life, and, he, and will you, will you f fulfill that? It's, that? it's your responsibility before God, as God's been speaking to your heart, to answer the call of God. Because we're not denying man. You're denying God. If God's got, indeed, has that calling and that, and that, and that work upon your life. You're not denying man. Not denying the pastor or the leadership, but you're denying God. Whom God chooses. Remember, God does the choosing. God does the equipping. God looks at the heart. So God knows when we're ready. God is ready to prepare our heart. But we have to answer that call because if we don't, we're in disobedience to God. And then God's work won't be able to be all that He wants it to be. And we'll, and we'll miss out on the fruit and the wonderful fruit that God wants to do in us and through his body here to accomplish his wonderful work. So, as God's speaking to our hearts, listen, and what is God saying to us as individuals? What is he saying to our hearts? What, is he been, what has he been saying? What has he been doing in our hearts? What has he been doing in our lives? To confirm that, that work and that calling, those gifts, in our hearts and our minds. What has he been doing? And what does he want you to do now? As a part of that. Answer the call of God. Whether it's a servant or whatever gifting it is. It doesn't necessarily have to be a pastor. But it's got, God's got a call in our lives for whatever area of service and within his body. We must answer the call and answer with a cheerful heart, saying, Yes, Lord, hear my. Yes, Lord, hear my. Do whatever you want to do. Accomplish your work. Accomplish what you want to do as only you can do in and through me. Because that's what I want, God. And when that happens, and when you have that kind of heart, the church will explode. The church will be all that God wants to be. And the gospel will go out into all the world. The gospel will be all that God wants it to be. Amen? Amen. A godly mom is built on the character of a godly mom. Because great women are not just great women because they're strong and such. Great women are strong because their God is strong. They have a strong relationship. You know what? Great moms leave a lasting legacy for many generations. Think about the, the many single moms that have been out there over history raising children to raise godly men. Think about the parents. Think about the moms who, I think of Billy Graham's mom. Billy Graham, Ruth Graham's wife, Ruth Graham's out.